All right, take it away, Mark. Great. Well, um, thanks very much for the invite. I've actually spoken to this group on a number of occasions uh, over the years um, before I, I actually joined Cambridge. So I think this is probably the first time I've spoken to you um, since, since I came to Cambridge in 2019. Um, I took up uh, the chair that was made vacant by uh, Lord Robert Mayer uh, when he retired uh, and to go to the, the House of Lords. Uh, so that's the Sir Kirby Line Chair of Civil Engineering. Um, but uh, before I came to, to Cambridge, I was uh, Professor of Statistics in the Department of Mathematics at Imperial College in, in London. So moving from the Department of Mathematics and the Chair of Statistics to the Department of Engineering and a Chair in Civil Engineering was, was, was quite a jump. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. But at, at the end of the day, um, the, the key questions of probabilistic and statistical modeling uh, are pretty universal uh, and find application and demand in just about every area. So um, <clears throat> it's actually been quite a nice move. Um, shall I just start on the, the presentation now? Sounds good. Okay, so th th this is a thing called um, the statistical finite element method and uh, there's a number of people that have contributed to this work uh, across Cambridge um, and the Alan Turing Institute in, in London uh, and, and some other places like the University of Western Australia in, in Perth. And this work is ongoing both in terms of um, foundational theory and, and theoretical analysis, uh, as well as methodological development uh, and deployment on a number of, um, of quite significant applications, which I'll, I'll just allude to uh, in, the, in the talk. So what I thought I would do, and what hopefully would be useful for you, is I'll give you a very brief non-technical uh, overview of what the finite element method is and then highlight why in actual fact, uh, despite it being an incredibly powerful uh, set of tools, it still has one major uh, shortcoming or it has had one major uh, shortcoming uh, and that is the absence of any statistical or probabilistic uh, semantics. And so I'll then start to present the, 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 the basis of this work, which is the definition of a, a statistical model uh, for finite elements. And then I'll give some, uh, some examples. And if you just please, uh, feel free to ask questions and interrupt uh, as I go along. Okay, so what is the finite element method? Well, we, we have to go back to what exactly the finite element method uh, is trying to do. What is the problem it is trying to solve? Uh, and it is a way of numerically solving systems of partial differential equations uh, in their most general form. And if I just give you uh, an example here, and this is very much the textbook kind of schoolboy example uh, that is used to uh, present uh, what the finite element method is. So let's just imagine in R2, so in, in 2D, we have got some bounded domain, right? So this little square here, and um, within this domain, a partial differential equation is defined. And so this is very much uh, the sort of classical PDEs 101 uh, Poisson equation where we have a divergence uh, operator acting on the product of some tensor, some um, diffusion tensor, 
uh, which is defined uh, at the coordinates within the domain, there are probably some set of parameters, uh, lambda, associated with it. Um, and this is uh, the, the, the product of this and the gradient of a function u, which is what we're interested in. Okay, so we take the divergence of the product of, of a and grad uh, u, uh, and that's balanced with some uh, forcing function, which again would be acting uh, at each point within this domain. And there would also be um, conditions that would be satisfied uh, on the boundary of the domain, the boundary conditions. Uh, and in this case here, what we would say is, is that we know uh, that the value of the function is zero uh, around the domain. Now, uh, what, what I've shown is uh, a very simple uh, linear partial differential equation um, and a very regular uh, domain. The reality is, is that the PDEs may well be nonlinear and the domain itself uh, may be highly non-regular. And so you could imagine in 2D, uh, we could have a model of, for example, the steady state uh, temperature distribution on some plate, uh, or it could be on you know, some, some region of interest, which may not necessarily, as I said, be uh, particularly uh, regular <clears throat> in terms of its geometry. So the question is, how can we uh, solve this system uh, in a numerical way when there are no uh, analytic solutions available to us? Now, in, in this case here, uh, we can obtain analytic solutions, but if, if we were to change the domain to something, uh, as I said, that's not regular, uh, then we would be unable to um, employ uh, analytic methods uh, to, to get what the actual function of interest uh, U happens to be. So <clears throat> what does the finite element method do? Well, the very first thing it does is it defines what's called the weak form. And the weak form um, is, is quite an elegant way of defining, um, generically anyway, uh, derivatives. Now, what you can see here is that immediately this divergence and gradient operator, this, this Laplacian operator, uh, is going to demand certain regularity conditions on the function u and therefore uh, conditions on the space that we would consider uh, of, of possible solutions. Uh, and in this case here, you can see that, you know, we, we, we need second order uh, smoothness, uh, second order derivatives uh, to, to, to be available. But what the weak form does um, is, first of all, if, if I take a set of what we would call test functions V, which are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, drawn from some Sobolev space where we have um, first order uh, smoothness. So uh, we, we have uh, first, first order derivatives, which would be in um, some Hilbert space. And what we do is we take the product of um, examples from this space with the PDE and we integrate over the, the domain uh, of, of interest. Again, a little bit of schoolboy <clears throat> integration shows us immediately that this, uh, this product and integration uh, does something quite interesting. It immediately takes away the requirement for you to be second order smooth. And you can see that what's happened is, is that the smoothness, or certainly first order smoothness, uh, is now transferred uh, onto the test function, and all that we require is that uh, u is um, smooth to first order uh, rather than uh, to second order here. So, um, so th this this is a characteristic of the uh, what's called the weak form. Um, 
Uh, the right-hand side, of course, is now just going to be an inner product between the forcing function f and uh, the test functions. So we can write this in compact form uh, just by defining some uh, linear operator, in this case, a bilinear operator that takes two functions u and v. Um, and so this calligraphic a uh, indexed by whatever the parameters lambda are uh, defining this diffusion tensor. Uh, this bilinear form okay, um, is basically going to be equal to the inner product of the forcing and the, uh, uh, the, the, the test function. So now that we have this, we can then define a, a subspace of this infinite dimensional uh, function space um, calligraphic V, um, one which is finite dimensional and its dimensionality is defined by uh, some uh, scalar value, we'll call it H. So we say that we have a, a subspace V sub H of our, uh, our, our original uh, test function space. And um, we can say that uh, this space is spanned by a set of uh, basis functions, whatever those happen to be. So then the bilinear form, this variational construction, variational in the mathematical sense rather than in the machine learning sense, uh, becomes a finite dimensional problem. And so the, the function u is going to be some truncated expansion, uh, a weighted expansion of uh, the, the basis set, which we posit to span uh, the subspace that we're, we're interested in. And so what we now have is in essence, uh, a, a system of uh, a finite dimensional system of linear operator equations um, acting on the basis functions phi, and uh, these coefficients now uh, of, of our expansion uh, u. So that would be the, the finite dimensional uh, approximation. And um, it turns out that um, what we end up with, if we were to write this in, uh, in vector matrix notation, would basically just be a linear system uh, in the M by M uh, dimensional, uh, what would be called the stiffness matrix, so the, the finite dimensional representation of the bilinear form, the M dimensional vector of unknown uh, function values and uh, the inner products uh, at each of the, the M uh, with, with the forcing function F. And so that linear system uh, can then be solved for uh, the, the UH uh, coefficients. And that in essence uh, is the, the definition uh, of the finite element uh, algorithm or the Galeorkin uh, projection algorithm. Now, the way in which we choose these basis functions uh, is quite critical for computational purposes uh, and also for the way in which uh, we basically cover the space associated uh, with the domain. So as you've seen, we have a very simple regular square domain here. And so if we uh, define basis functions on some mesh, regular mesh like this, um, then you can see how our phi IJs uh, would be defined. But the, the key here is that this mesh uh, can now uh, define subsets of irregular domains. And this is one of the, well, this, this, this is the key uh, powerful uh, component of the finite element method is that we can now um, model the response of some physical or some chemical or whatever, a system that's described by a system of partial differential equations 
on some highly irregular domain, uh, and we can do this both in an, uh, an efficient manner computationally uh, and mathematically in terms of the efficiency of the, the function approximation, which we'll come on to just shortly. I won't go through the details of how we um, make a, a finite mesh um, that, that is overlaid on our, our domain, but suffice to say that that's in essence the finite element component. Um, we have a finite number uh, of mesh elements uh, on which we cover the, the domain. Now, the, the thing to remember um, in machine learning, our, our the domains that we would be interested in could be arbitrarily uh, high dimensional. In most physical problems, the domains that we would be interested in would either be 1, 2, uh, or 3D, potentially 4D, you know, if we take Euclidean space or, you know, some, some uh, X, Y, Z space and time. Um, but apart from that, we probably wouldn't go any higher. Uh, so the majority of finite element methods uh, and deployments are used on describing physical systems um, in, in the physical world. So you wouldn't tend to see finite element methods used on you know, R100 or R1000 as you would in, uh, in machine learning. Typically here, it would be R2, R3, potentially R4 as well for time evolving uh, problems. So that's the, that's the finite element space. Um, the key piece of analysis uh, that's probably important here is that if we take a set of uh, polynomials as our basis functions, uh, and in particular, a uh, first order uh, polynomials, so just a linear, um, what's called a hat function on a mesh element, um, then um, what we can actually, uh, again, it's a kind of straightforward uh, exam question, but we can show that the error induced by the projection onto the finite element from the original function space, right, so the, the error norm in L2 uh, is going to be bounded, right, or dominated uh, by the square of H. And H, of course, is the uh, basically the uh, characteristic length of the meshes uh, in, the, uh, in the domain. So clearly, as, as, as H gets finer, as the mesh gets more refined, uh, then the error uh, decreases, and it decreases uh, at order H squared. And then the constants, of course, um, as you would expect, um, there's a term here um, based on the, the relative smoothness of the, the actual function U itself. So we could, we could get higher rates of convergence um, depending on the, the level of smoothness uh, of, of the functions that we're trying to approximate. Okay, so that's the finite element method and it, it really has been, I said it in my abstract, it's a, it's a real triumph of modern day applied mathematics, software development, algorithm development. Um, it, it is applied, applied in, in many, many areas. So you can see here that um, the, the PDEs describing electrom, uh, you know, electromagnetic phenomena in some rotor system uh, are being solved to understand uh, you know, what, what the magnetic field looks like in this rotor stator system, very complex geometry. Um, you can see here the, um, the uh, <clears throat> compatibility and equilibrium uh, equations of some very, very complex structure, uh, again, um, uh, you know, ca can be solved. Uh, and, and we can study, um, you know, what the stresses and strains and what the uh, potential uh, failure modes would be. And, you know, here's a really nice example here of a, a very non-regular domain, right? So someone's jaw uh, in 3D, uh, it's all been meshed up and, um, you know, we can simulate, you know, some kind of chewing force uh, and potentially some imbalance uh, because of muscular imbalance or what have you. 
uh, and we can look and then you know study what what are the strains what are the stresses um, and, and where are they concentrated uh, in in this um, biological uh, structure so that's the finite element method in a nutshell uh, we basically take a partial differential equation we uh, set up a, a particular function space uh, which is defined by some basis set. We then project uh, the weak form uh, onto uh, a, 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 a lower dimensional subspace, which, whose dimensionality is going to be defined by the mesh that we've used to discretize uh, our domain. We end up with a linear system of equations, AU equals B, and we solve for U. And we're done. And this is the classical uh, Galeorkin, uh, the famous Russian uh, mathematician method uh, that, that's used uh, as, as the, the, uh, one of the main workhorses uh, in solving finite element uh, problems. So great stuff. So why is there a need for a statistical construction of the finite element method? Well, the first thing we have to realize and probably speaking to a machine learning audience this is you know this this, this is um, nothing terribly new but maybe for mathematicians this is sometimes a bit difficult to to appreciate is that the models that we are considering so Poisson's equation is a model and it's very interesting if you read the history, you know, the, the, the history of Victorian natural philosophy, the, 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 the great natural philosophers who were trying to study heat uh, and energy, um, you know, they, they started to come up with uh, these sorts of equations and they were criticized because these were macroscopic equations and not molecular um, representations of what was actually happening uh, in the ether. Uh, at the time. And so it, it, it's important that uh, we appreciate that uh, these equations are exactly that. They are models. They are idealized representations of the reality that we would like to try and study and understand. And as such, there is an inherent uncertainty due to the fact that there is going to be some mis misspecification at some sort of scale, um, uh, in some cases, that misspecification can be fairly benign and, and you know, not terribly of, of great uh, interest, depending on the scale that we're operating at. And in other cases, it can be actually uh, really very important if there are certain components of physics or physics chem chemistry interaction uh, that are missing or the geometry of the domain is, is not captured terribly well. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we can generate data, so we can make measurements. And the question is, how do we assimilate that data into these finite element models? Um, so, of course, the way that we, we would do this is that we would define a probabilistic model and what we decided to do was not to say, well, we'll take the finite element method and then we'll embed it within some probabilistic or some statistical model. But we'll actually start from scratch and we'll define a probabilistic or a statistical finite element method. And so the very first thing that we need to do, because we're working in, in function spaces and we want probabilistic semantics, is that we need to define a, me a probability measure in the function spaces that we are operating in. As of course, the function spaces that we're operating in here are these Sobolev spaces, H1, uh, H2, and so on. Nevertheless, they, they, are, they are Hilbert spaces. And that then really drives us to the selection of a dominating measure, uh, which is going to be a Gaussian uh, measure. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have heard that there's a, a, a course uh, for fourth years in the engineering tripos 4M24. And if any of you have done it, 
you will know why uh, Gaussian reference measures uh, are well-defined and infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces, whereas the more common um, reference measure that, that we all kind of work with in RN, Lebesgue measure, uh, is ill-defined. And so we have to use something that is well-defined in these infinite dimensional spaces. And that leads us to the Gaussian reference measure. And so you said that this group is Bayesian, so we could consider this reference measure as a prior for subsequent uh, statistical inference. So what we're going to do is we're going to posit uh, a Gaussian in the Sobolev space uh, so we're going to say that the, the realizations of these functions u um, are going to have some measure uh, mu naught, which is, is Gaussian, um, which is going to have some mean function and some covariance operator, uh, which satisfies the, the, the usual requirements of finite nuclear norm or trace class and so on, so that these are well defined um, on each one. And then it turns out that, you know, we can change the measure uh, just in the, in the sort of standard against schoolboy probability theory manner by taking a radon nicodyne derivative um, with respect to the, the, the dominating measure in the function space. Uh, and what in fact we would end up um, defining here is the radon nicodyne derivative uh, of a measure uh, in this case, it would be a posterior measure, which is now conditioned on some observations Y um, with respect to the reference measure, which is Gaussian. And this would then define um, some function where this, this potential here is a function of observed data, some observation operator, and then the, the, the function of interest, the function that satisfies uh, the PDE that we're interested in. Um, and so we'd say that we've got n dimensional, so we've got n um, observations, um, y, uh, which would just be some vector in Rn. We would have some um, projection operator, which is going to take us from the function space to our observation space, and then some potential function uh, of all of these three things. And we could interpret that as a log. Uh, um, of, of, of some uh, probability of the data associate uh, conditional on um, HU. Um, so this would be the projection of the function values uh, onto the observation points in the domain. And in essence, this, uh, this, this reference forms the basis for statistical inferences, as you're all aware. Key thing here is that we now need to construct that prior, uh, this, um, this reference measure. So how does one go about doing that? Well, let, let's take the, the standard uh, Poisson equation uh, and we'll look at it in its weak form. So the bilinear form of the unknown function against uh, some test function from H1. Uh, we have the inner product of our, uh, our forcing function. And then what we've got here is some randomized uh, function, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we could consider this as, you know, some, some mean uh, forcing, uh, which is drawn from uh, some function space, uh, which has some uh, measure associated with it. And that measure, uh, clearly we're working in function spaces would be Gaussian. So of course, all of you here would immediately recognize this as a, a Gaussian, we could say this is some Gaussian process. So our, our randomized forcing uh, of the weak form uh, is going to be a realization of some Gaussian process or some Gaussian measure um, with some certain mean and some certain uh, covariance covariance function. Okay, well, um, let's take a spectral expansion of our function. So some, some set of coefficients, some, some uh, basis set, um, and we've basically got this 
uh, inner product, this, this, this infinite uh, sum. Um, these basis functions are just going to be sort of standard uh, spectral. And um, what we can then do is rewrite the stochastic uh, weak form uh, in this form here in terms of uh, the, the, the spectral basis functions. Now, what you'll see immediately is that as this psi, uh, you, you know, has, has Gaussian measure, then because of this whole linear operation, we can see that there's going to be a push forward of the measure on psi to a measure on u. And so immediately we've now induced a measure, a Gaussian measure on the components uh, that define our unknown function. So we, we've induced the, the dominating measure in the, the function space that we're interested in. In like manner, uh, and, and there's a whole load of detail here about um, how well this is defined, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll see that in the appendices of, of, of some of our papers, but there's, there's, there's no need to, to go through that at the moment. Uh, the key point here is that we then follow the, uh, the same construction of the Galeorkin projection, where we project from our, our function space into some subspace of it, finite dimensional. Um, so we basically truncate this infinite uh, summation to one that is um, finite dimensional. And so we have our truncated uh, approximation. In, in usual form. And in likewise manner, when the finite element method is constructed, the infinite dimensional bilinear form basically becomes a linear form uh, in terms of some matrix uh, and some vector. And in similar fashion here, what happens uh, is that uh, in the finite dimensional scheme, we end up inducing uh, a Gaussian law on the uh, n-dimensional coefficients that we're interested in, uh, which of course would be conditional on um, the parameters uh, of the diffusion tensor, parameters of the measure associated with psi, the value of f. Um, and what it looks like is something that, again, you'll be very familiar with. Uh, we basically have this Gaussian measure with some mean function, and the mean function you'll immediately recognize as the solution of the deterministic uh, linear system that defines the Galeorkin construction. And then some covariance where, um, in essence, we have this A matrix is the finite dimensional matrix um, composed of the uh, values of the the bilinear form induced by the, 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 oper the PDE operator um, at each of the discrete mesh points in the domain. Uh, and this is, this is typically called the, the stiffness matrix because in linear elasticity, that's exactly what it is. It's defining the stiffness. And then G is basically a convolution of the covariance function uh, defining the randomized forcing uh, with the, uh, the basis functions. And so you could look at this through the lens of Gaussian processes and say that what we've got is a, a Gaussian process which can be used uh, as our, our reference measure uh, or as our prior, uh, if we want to do Bayesian inference, um, in, in defining uh, a statistical finite element solution. And what's interesting here, of course, is that we have complete consistency between uh, this, this measure here uh, and the Galeorkin projection scheme. So as G, so as the covariance of G shrinks to zero, then this, of course, um, this, this Gaussian measure will, um, um, will, will converge to a Dirac measure on the Galeorkin uh, solution of the linear system. So that's quite uh, comforting, certainly for applied mathematicians.
So the basis functions, we can then um, you know, go from spectral uh, basis functions to finite element uh, basis functions. And in essence, what we've done, if we want to be Bayesian, uh, we can say that we have now defined a Gaussian process prior on the finite element uh, function space. Uh, and, and one of the things that's quite nice about this from a machine learning perspective is that we've got a Gaussian process here whose covariance function uh, basically encapsulates all of the physics that is described in the PDEs. So you've got some kind of physics informed uh, GP, if you will. Uh, and if we don't want to be Bayesian, well, we now have a well-defined uh, reference measure, um, which is well-defined uh, in the limit. So as n tends to infinity, as we go back to the original Hilbert space, um, then we have a well-defined uh, Gaussian uh, measure where these a minus one um, matrix operators will then become the Green's functions or associated with the, uh, the PDE um, um, operator. So this is kind of cool. Um, so, so what we've done is we've now defined, as I said, this, this reference, or if we want to be based on this prior um, on the, uh, the finite element uh, solution. Let's just give you a quick example. Very simple, one-dimensional uh, Poisson model with uh, just, just uh, a fixed uh, diffusion. So we've just got this um, um, grad, grad squared of u is just equal to one plus some stochastic forcing. And the domain is just the unit line. The boundary conditions at the uh, zero end and the unit end of the unit line uh, is such that the function is zero. And if we have, again, a functional prior, GP prior uh, on the forcing, and we uh, just push all that through, then we get uh, our, um, our reference measure. And this is really nice because uh, in, in the finite element method, um, what the Galley-Orkin solution would give us would be this mean. But there would be no indication at all as to what sort of levels of, un of prior uh, uncertainty in the absence of any measurements uh, we could expect. So we have this naturally here. Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, so I don't need to, to labor this point at all. So that's nice. Um, and we could look at various other uh, examples where in this case, uh, we now have uh, a, an actual uh, diffusion term. And um, again, uh, you know, what we can, see, what, what we can now see um, is that you know the diffusivity uh, and the randomness in that diffusivity uh, is now going to uh, have an effect on the actual solutions. And again, what you can see maybe uh, in blue is the marginal mean of u, which is um, what you would get if you use the if you use kind of Monte Carlo simulation with um, uh, Galli Orkin. Uh, but what we've now got here is we can see the, um, the uncertainty associated uh, with the distributional characteristics of the diffusivity and of the forcing. So this is all quite nice. Um, now, th this, this is the classical linear uh, FEM construction. If we go to nonlinear PDEs, uh, then things get a bit more technical. Um, and some of the things that we're now working on uh, is, is the, the development of uh, EULA or unadjusted Longevin uh, algorithms uh, to uh, obtain uh, solutions uh, of, for, for nonlinear PDEs. And I'll give you some examples of time varying nonlinear PDEs uh, just shortly. Now, as far as this uh, prior measure is concerned, this reference measure, so whatever, if you're Bayesian, if you're, if you're not Bayesian, we've got, we've got a probability measure that's well-defined in the function space and in any subspaces um, which we, we project onto it. So um, some analysis uh, on that uh, measure 
we, we've conducted some, some analysis. I won't bore you with the details, but if you think about the error analysis in, in, in classical finite elements, you're looking at what is the error induced between the unknown function and the finite element solution. And we know that it's dominated by order h squared where h is the effective size uh, of the meshes used in the, um, in, in the mesh. Now we are more interested in, in probabilistic statements. Uh, and again, I won't uh, go through the details, um, but one thing that, that's interesting is that there are complications because we're working in function spaces. And if you think about um, mm -hmm. the, the, the question that's asked classically in analysis is to say, that what is the, the, the distance in some metric um, between our function u in the Hilbert space and uh in the, 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 the corresponding subspace? Now, there is no impediment uh, to defining what that uh, error happens to be because we can just define a metric um, L2 and we're done. Here on the other hand, we're, we're looking to make probabilistic statements. And so one of the issues is that it's not entirely clear if the measures on U, so the Gaussian measure in the, the, the Hilbert space, which we defined um, uh, for U, and the finite dimensional um, uh, measure uh, for um, UH, uh, it's not clear whether they would be absolutely continuous with respect to each other, or in fact, they would be mutually singular. And so what that means then is that the sort of classical method, so KL typically used in defining elbows, we can't use it. Fisher, Hellinger distances, usual divergences, because we, we cannot guarantee um, that these two measures are not mutually singular in the function space, um, then what we have to look at are, are some sort of Wasserstein distances. And in typ typical form, we, we've, um, we've done some analysis uh, and, and we have results for Wasserstein two distance between measures in the Hilbert space uh, over the unknown function that we want and over the approximating function. And what's really quite nice is that the Wasserstein two uh, distance between those measures is, um, is bounded um, with order h squared. Um, so there's a nice consistency between the classical functional analysis uh, and the probabilistic analysis um, that, that's done when we, we introduce this, uh, this measure-based construction of FEM. Um, again, I won't bore you with the um, further details, but let, let, let's move on to, so the, the good thing is, is that, you know, we have something that's well-defined and that's going to be consistent uh, in terms of projecting up or projecting down, um, uh, consistent in terms of convergence as far as the probability uh, measures are concerned, um, and that is consistent with the convergence of realizations from those probability measures. So in terms of actual function values, brilliant. So we've got our, uh, our prior. What about combining with data? So uh, let's say that we, we go to our uh, unit square uh, somewhere in Cambridge and we make some measurements on our unit square and we want to uh, assimilate those measurements, that data, uh, into our, uh, our, our model for predictive purposes or for inferential purposes. We don't know parameters of some tensor or whatever. Um, well, again, I, I think this group here, I, I can skip through this fairly quickly because now that we have a, a probabilistic construction um, defining basically a probability over data conditioned on the finite element solution and um, assimilating that or conditioning that um, or combining it with a prior uh, to obtain a posterior uh, it is all very straightforward. Uh, so I, I won't bore you with 
with uh, too many details uh, here. Um, I think they're all fairly, fairly straightforward. But the, the, the key point here is that um, if you think about the finite element method, um, the, the only analysis that can be done is making statements about the error between the approximation and what the actual function that solves the PDE happens to be. We can ask questions about um, what is the uh, what is the error between our finite element solution and the true function which our PDE is trying to model. So, in other words, taking into account the fact that there is misspecification, structural misspecification, in the model. Of course, we can do that very straightforwardly now. Why? Because if we if we posit that the measurements that we make uh, are um, potentially error based and noisy based. Um, realizations of the true process that we are interested in, then um, by combination of that data via a likelihood and the prior measure on the finite element solution, what it means is, again, you're all Bayesians, is that we can now define a posterior over our finite element solution where now we are conditioning on data. And so this is, an, th I mean, th this is the way in which we can now assess, correct for um, model misspecification. And of course, this is a coherent way of combining our prior, the physical knowledge that we have with observed data and taking account of model mismatch, uh, again, in, in a, a, a consistent and coherent way. And that's what this statistical finite element prior construction does, is it allows us to embed known information from, say, the physics uh, into the problem, uh, and we can rigorously uh, incorporate data uh, into that uh, in, in any subsequent uh, inference procedure. So that's all cool. Um, and those of you who are GP aficionados will no doubt see a whole load of possible opportunities for using things like Bayesian optimization, you know, for making experiments. So in, in, in civil engineering, for example, you know, doing an experiment involves drilling big holes, uh, which can cost millions. Um, so, you know, we can't uh, take a regular grid over some, uh, you know, piece of land and just drill away to get data. So Bayesian optimization would be one very nice way of exploiting the structural statistical uh, FEM uh, to um, basically design uh, or, or optimal experiments uh, for, well, whatever it is we're, we're interested in. Very cool. Um, a quick uh, kind of toy example um, that shows you how now we can deal with model misspecification. So here is our assumed model. Okay, so, uh, you know, we're saying, well, we've got some Laplacian operator uh, acting on some function u, and uh, there is some constant mean response and uh, some sort of uh, natural variability around that. So that is our hypothesized model. And what we're going to say is, is that um, in actual fact, the reality is that the data is generated from something that looks like this. So we have some mean, which uh, looks like this here. So it's a combination of these sinusoids. We, clearly, we just cooked this up to, uh, for illustrative purposes. So immediately, we can see that we've now got a misspecification in mean. Um, and uh, we're going to have uh, Green's functions of the 1D Laplacian. So there's no misspecification in terms of the, uh, the differential operator. The, 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 the misspecification is mainly in the, uh, 
the structure of the forcing. Nevertheless, it is um, a, a quite a severe misspecification. Um, for those of you that like MCMC, here are uh, some MCMC plots, but we'll not focus on that. Here um, is really the kind of uh, important thing here. If I look at the, the reference, if I look at the prior, right? So this would be my Galeorkin solution, right? To my finite element method of my hypothesized model. And if we were clever and we used, you know, a, a finite element uh, statistical uh, probabilistic construction, we might have some prior uh, uncertainty. Great. But we go and make measurements, right, which uh, come from the true generating process, right? So this is what nature uh, actually gives us. Um, and here are a whole load of ex uh, you know, experimental data points. And uh, so in essence, what we've got is in the domain, which is just from zero to one, one D, uh, we've got 33 points where we make measurements. So that's an awful lot. Uh, and at each one of those points, we make a hundred repeated observations. And so this is our data. Now, what we can do is we can just turn the crank and move from the data agnostic finite element solution in mean uh, and the prior uncertainty in, in kind of uh, blue here and move to an induced posterior right, or updated uh, measure uh, given this data. And what we now see uh, is that the posterior over the finite element solution has moved um, somewhat uh, you know, from the, the physics misspecified model to the, uh, the actual um, um, data uh, conditioned uh, representation. Now, what's interesting here is that, um, you know, because that we have this second order, this Laplacian uh, function, then you can see that the, uh, the, the, the function uh, the mean function here in this case uh, of the posterior uh, you know, is extremely smooth, and it's extremely smooth because of the uh, because of the Laplace uh, differential operator that is embedded uh, within the uh, the covariance uh, function, if you will, uh, of of the star FEM method. So this is kind of cool. Actually, it's really cool uh, because it. It provides for the first time a way of assessing um, the relevance of, of, of misspecification um, in physical models uh, based on mathematical assumptions um, that are either explicit or, or, or implicit in, in some sense. Uh, and so we can use data to coherently uh, and consistently uh, correct for that. Let me show you a, a, a real example here of where this is being used. Um, how much longer do you want me to talk for? About another five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, or, or just, you know, just plead with me to stop when you've had enough. Um, so uh, Network Rail operates thousands of bridges across the UK. And what do these bridges do? they let trains run over them. Nothing terribly exciting uh, about that. Well, what, be, what gets exciting is when these fail and certain parts of train lines uh, get closed down and then it causes havoc. And during the summer, there's nothing worse than standing on a very hot platform waiting for a train that's delayed or has been canceled, typically due to either a mechanical fault on the trains or a structural fault on the actual rail system as well. And I'm sure we've all experienced it. So one of the, the, the main drivers is to make the uh, operation of, of these sorts of assets more efficient. 
And one way of doing that is by the remote monitoring of the condition uh, of, of these systems. And so at Cambridge, uh, when, when these bridges were being constructed, a team from, from Cambridge Engineering um, worked with the, well, whoever it was that was um, constructing the bridges for Network Rail, um, but embedded fiber optic cables uh, within the bridges, within the poured concrete. And these fiber optic cables had what are called fiber brag gratings on them, uh, which you basically measure uh, optically uh, changes in temperature and, and changes in strain. And so, so when these bridges came into operation, um, what they were doing was producing, um, I think there was something like 180 uh, sensor locations. So uh, each one of these bridges produces about a terabyte of data a day. And that data can then be used in remote fashion to assess the health and the efficiency uh, of this, this actual uh, lump of steel reinforced concrete. So if you think about it, the instrumented bridge is the natural, is the truth. And the data that's coming off it is to first order a representation uh, of what physically is going on in this case here, what are the stresses, what are the strains uh, that, that are being experienced um, in, in this 3D structure. So we have the truth and the strain data is being measured and that gives us data why. Now, um, what historically would be done is that a finite element model would be made and uh, it would be tested uh, to make sure that it doesn't fall apart when a train goes over it. And, um, and that's it. But if you think about what the statistical finite element method allows us to do is it allows us to couple this model with the actual physical reality via the data that we are measuring. And so what that means is that in the very simple toy example I showed you, whatever misspecification there is in this model original, initially uh, can now be updated in posterior fashion um, based on data that, that's coming from this. Uh, and then subsequently, um, this itself can be used as a tool or a, as a, an asset, and it's sometimes called the digital twin uh, of the physical system uh, in terms of monitoring uh, its performance and making assessments of what is the sort of trajectory uh, of performance of this thing uh, uh, as, as time goes by. So, um, so that's quite exciting. Um, and again, I, I won't go through all of the sort of technical details, but suffice to say that, you know, he, here's an example of, of, of some data uh, at one, or sorry, at two uh, of, of the, uh, the, the points uh, that, that where data is measured. Um, and, uh, and what you can see is, is basically one, two, three, four, car five carriages uh, going across the, the bridge. And so, so you, you, know, you can see the response uh, and, and then the relaxation once the, the thing goes over it. So you've got this kind of time evolving thing. And so these are, these are posterior means, right? Uh, realizations. Um, of the uh, of how the bridge uh, actually reacts uh, as a train goes over it, um, and what's really cool is that we can now, uh, at each time point, we can actually draw you know, loads of samples of, of, of functional realizations of the bridge response, and we can, you know, we can do the sort of clever statistical things that look at you know what would be the maximum, what would be the minimum deflection, what is the probability of that, and and so on. So this is really cool uh, because this this is taking you know some some basic foundational work and uh, you know seeing it actually used in real life is is is, is kind of cool. Again, I won't go through some of these. Let me give you in, in closing one final example, um, and this is work that we were doing with Shell 
uh, out in Western Australia, and, and they're worried about what, what are called solitons. So these are these uh, subsea waves uh, which develop over time, develop huge amounts of momentum and energy. And if they interact with uh, an offshore structure, like, like cable ties on, on, on a stationary ship, uh, or, or you know whatever um, um, wind turbine foundations, uh, they can really have quite catastrophic effects. And so what uh, Shell asked us to do was to build some models uh, and use data that they get from the uh, the ocean conditions uh, to to do some kind of statistical analysis to, in, in predicting the the likelihood of solitons developing in a particular region. There are very classical non-linear time evolving partial differential equations that describe these, uh, uh, th these types of waves. So here you can see we've got um, partial differential equation in U. Um, we've got first order derivatives, we've got third order derivatives, we've got non-linear interactions and we've got time evolution, pretty complex uh, uh, stuff. We, if we build a uh, stat FEM uh, construction in this nonlinear case, um, then inference uh, proceeds uh, by the use of um, particle filter or um, uh, sequential Monte Carlo. Uh, and, and what we've used here uh, are ensemble Kalman uh, filter type schemes. It's interesting that um, for a time evolving linear PDE, uh, then posterior inference. Um, basically boils down to, um, uh, well, basically a crank, a crank Nicholson uh, um, uh, scheme um, embedded within a Kalman filter. Kind of cool. Uh, so here we've got, we're, uh, because we're working with nonlinear phenomena, we, we're, we're dealing with, or we, we use both ensemble uh, and extended Kalman filters. I won't go through all of the technical details. But we, we set up a, a, a tank of, of salt water. So this little thing here is showing you the tank of salt water. And there is a gradient um, associated with the salinity uh, in, the, in this tank. Uh, and there are a number of um, gauges uh, at, at a few points in the tank, which makes measurements of the, uh, the amplitude of the waves at each of those points. Uh, in space and in time. And so here you can see the data here, and you can clearly see, you know, that the soliton uh, behavior starting to, to develop uh, as time progresses. If we um, use standard e finite elements, then um, there's clearly uh, going to be a mismatch between uh, what we see, what we measure uh, from the tank of water and our idealized PDE. Um, I, and we can see that, uh, let me just get this. Yeah, so, so the very light blue is the, the, the sort of idealized PDE solutions. And if I look at the, uh, the, the, the data condition, the, the posterior, we'll call it uh, statistical finite element solution uh, in blue, we can see how it has really been pulled uh, towards the data. And so this, this misspecification, um, in, in, in which presents itself in terms of a, um, a misalignment in phase uh, of, of, of the developing waves uh, is, is corrected for. And, and, and we get these very nice posterior profiles, uh, which was kind of cool. Um, ongoing work. Um, sampling from the prior, again, I mentioned uh, unadjusted Longevin methods. Um, I, I, I won't go into to that. Again, the, the analysis, there's analysis uh, as far as uh, um, the, the errors and the rates of convergence uh, are concerned, which is all nice and comforting to know. Um, and we've started work on that already. So let me just conclude uh, by saying that. Um, this statistical or probabilistic construction of the finite element method enable us to synthesize data 
and physics informed uh, mathematical descriptions uh, of mathematical uh, models uh, using the finite element construction. And it uh, yields uh, this change in measure, uh, this, this posterior uh, over uh, the, the finite element solutions. And we've developed the methodology We've developed uh, some analysis uh, for both linear and non-linear, for both time invariant and time evolving uh, PDEs. And we've got a couple of papers, uh, one in, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, which you, know, you, you can look at. And there's lots of, there's lots of cool things that um, can be done next. I mean, there's all the machine learning work, you know, I mentioned Bayesian optimization, um, you know, the sort of cool things that are being done in GPs, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of really cool applications, digital twinning to, you know, various physical uh, phenomena. Um, we've, yeah, yeah, I, I won't go into those details. And um, there are other uh, systems, hyperbolic systems, um, and then moving from finite elements to, to finite volumes, um, you know, considering fluids and so on. So from the basic physics to, you know, some analysis to actual applications, the use of machine learning, there's lots of really cool things um, that, uh, you know, can, can be done here. And, and there's two papers that, that uh, pretty much describe what, what we've done. Uh, this first one is very much engineering based and, and very typical of, 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 of the sort of papers you would see in, in machine learning um, outlets. And this one is more scientifically based. Um, so that's it, gents or ladies and gents. And I will stop there and see if anyone's still awake. Great, thanks so much, Mark. Um, yeah, I guess we'll open the floor to questions. I mean, I'm, I'm actually going to start because I, I had a few, few questions. So I guess uh, maybe the first is about noise. Um, so you say you're conditioning on data, um, but one might argue that you never really observe the, the true values of the data. You always observe data plus some sort of measurement noise. And maybe this measurement noise is also difficult to specify properly. So maybe the two questions I could ask specifically are one, do you account for measurement noise um, and in any sort of way? And number two is that if if you do account for it, I guess just like it's easy to misspecify the underlying PE, it's probably also easy to misspecify your noise model. Um, and would, would that almost uh, defeat the purpose of conditioning on data if your mis noise model is misspecified? That's a great question. And indeed, uh, you, you, you could, you could imagine that, you know, not only is your data, um, you know, the, the, the way in which you measure the data, that there is some kind of um, sensor or, or probe precision associated with it, but the data itself or the measurements that you're making could be derived functions of what it is you're, you're, you're actually interested in. And so, of, of course, all of that would have to be very carefully uh, modeled. But again, the, the, the key thing is that, um, you know, that's what statisticians have been doing for a very long time, is, is modeling data and, and modeling the implications of data misspecification and so on. So, um, so, so the, um, I mean, the, the focus that, that, we, that, that we had was, you know, you can make measurements, how can we then embed or assimilate those measurements into what has been a classical and deterministic uh, mathematical construction. Um, the point that you now make is, is the sort of questions that statisticians ask is, you know, what is the balance between the uh, misspecification in the model and the misspecification in the data process? So a very good example, in fact, of that is um, if we stray from, um, you know, say systems that are based on physics, like the weather system or what have you, and we look at socioeconomic behavior. Um, you, you know, the, the model misspecification there is so severe 
that uh, you know it, it will just completely dominate any other errors, measurement errors, numerical errors. You, you know, and and, and therefore, you, you know, one would ask the question: Why even bother uh, with data? Uh, because you, because your misspecification is so bad, and really all that you're doing is is trying to codify a set of assumptions about you know whatever the socioeconomic phenomenon is that you're interested in. But as if we're dealing with things that are are, are rooted in sort of physical uh, theory, that then th th this sort of machinery is is very useful. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. I think uh, Will has another question. Uh, yeah, thanks for a, a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned um, that the discussed how the uh, your finite dimen uh, dimensional projection uh, converges to the the reference measure as you decrease your mesh, di mesh size in, in uh, Washington distance. I was I was wondering, um, does that does that kind of automatically carry over to the posterior as well, um, or does some kind of is there any chance anything could go wrong there? Um. So the, the, the answer is, I don't think it automatically carries over. I, I think there's the usual technical details, um, I, but because you've got a change of measure uh, between the prior and posterior, which has been constructed in such a way that um, they are absolutely continuous with respect to each other, then there will be a way of, 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 of getting those results uh, for the posterior in in, Vashast in, in Vashastein. Uh so so the technical issues would be uh, would 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 then focus on the uh, the properties of the, the the likelihood, so the measurability of the the, the likelihood uh, and so on, which, which um, you know would uh, would be required to to yeah yeah to to, to satisfy the. The absolute continuity between the prior and the posterior. So there's definitely a path in terms of analysis to, to get that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it would be straightforward. Well, maybe it is, but um, it's never straightforward for me. Thanks. So I have a question. It might pertain more to like the uh, finite element method in general than to the statistical version of it. But you mentioned that it's often used to solve physical problems, which is an advantage because actual physical problems happen in low dimensions. Uh, but Ken, what's the upper limit for dimensionality for these problems? Is it like three or four or can yeah, you, I mean, you push you, it to like 10 or something? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, you, you think of what you're doing is, is you're taking a domain and you're trying to fill it, right? So, and, and you can see that, you, know, you, 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 can, you can see that in, in 2D. Uh, and then once you go to 3D, uh, you know, things start to get messy. By the time you're in 10D, um, you, you know, you, you're really going to be struggling. And, you know, what one of the, so the Poisson equation for like, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, that's the kind of holy grail, because that then gives you, you know, the, the ideal transition operator, as it were. Um, but that could be operating in, in arbitrary high dimensions. And so, you know, tools like finite elements, are, 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 you know, they're, ju they're just not going to cut it. The, well, well, they would cut it. If, you know, if you had infinite computing resource, then of course, you know, it would be fine. But we don't. So, um, so, so, so typically, you know, but by the time you're in four dimensions, so you know, so three D physical space and time evolution, you're 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 at the limit. Okay. Thank you. And that and that's the same for meshless methods. So so, so I focused on on finite elements, which meshes uh, a domain. Um, the, 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 there are other approaches called meshless methods, um, and they they are used. They, they're very useful in physical systems where and you know you know imagine that you know this this is my domain, this little block, and I start to pull it, um, and a crack forms. So as soon as the crack starts to form, then the domain is changing. And so you then have to remesh it and it's a mess. Whereas meshless methods, what you basically do, you just throw a whole load of particles into the domain. The problem of course then is, is that as you go to higher dimensions, the number of particles that you require to get a representation of the domain is, is, is going to increase. And so it, it's, um, 
it's a fact of life that we just can't get away from. Yeah, the, the curse of dimensionality gets us all eventually. That, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you're trying to fill space and 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 um, and that's never easy. OK, thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think we had a question in the chat earlier. Um, yeah. Why was the weak form necessary? Why can't we just directly solve four coefficients for you in some basis? So, um, I mean, the reason for that is, so imagine that um, you've got your Laplace operator. So grad squared of u equals f. And let's say that f is not continuous. Let's say it's some kind of a heavy side function. Then, um, then you're in trouble because you can't get you know second order um, uh, smoothness uh, in, in the solutions. So what the weak form does is basically um, weakens the, that requirement and it allows you to get solutions uh, in cases where what's called the strong form, which is just directly solving uh, the, 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 the PDE uh, would not be feasible. So ones where you've got dis dis discontinuities, um, non-smooth functions, and so on. So that's why it's it, it's um, it, it's ne it's necessary. I think that makes sense. I that was by Austin. Does that answer your question, Austin? Uh, yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? I'll stop the recording in case you want to ask them offline.